And welcome back to Conrad's Corner, USC's only news radio talk show. And I am here alongside a very good friend of mine, to be honest with you. His name's Brian Ivey. He's here on Conrad's Corner. And it uh, took a while to get you on the show, man, <laughs> but uh, better late than never. How you doing, man? I'm doing very well, Conrad. How are you? I'm doing well. Doing well. So how's your Wednesday morning been this far? Oh, it's been good. It's been good. It's been a, it's been a pretty rough week. Had a lot of meetings. I'm um, splitting time between, between uh, school, finals, and stuff like that. And... Uh, and a lot of stuff uh, extracurricular, but uh, lots of extracurricular, oh, but, yes. but good extracurricular though, Certainly, which is really I think cool. We'll talk about this today. Yes, we will. Uh, but first off, did the notes work out all right for the Beatles midterm later they on today? Certainly <laughs> did. Thank you so much for those. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's my pleasure. Uh, one of the reasons why I had to send you notes, of course, is because you were in Africa shooting a documentary about mm-hmm. students making a difference. Tell me more about that. Sure. So, um, in the wake of uh, another project I did, I was invited overseas uh, with a nonprofit organization called Good Neighbors. Um, and basically, they are uh, a globetrotting organization that builds water wells in different uh, remote villages, especially in Africa. So um, seeing a lot of the work that I had done, they invited me over to Chad, to Chad, Africa, which is um, to them kind of seen as the dying heart of Africa. And they invited me over for a week to film um, kind of this commemorative event of the 140th well that they were building uh, in this remote uh, Muslim village in in a very, very rural area of Chad outside of the capital. Um, so we flew out there t- with a team of photographers and journalists and myself, and I was the main videographer. And I basically documented the process of where they um, retrieved water from before the well, building the well itself, and then the, the result of, of finally having clean water for the first time ever in this village. And, and the, the most incredible, profound thing and also tragic thing about it was that none of these kids um, had seen clean water in their entire lives until um, that day that we came. Wow. Yeah. And so are these students, I guess, building the wells or they're part of the program? Yeah, part of the program. But um, it's actually the, the Good Neighbors organization uses local engineers uh, and local workers and they use hand crank drills. So they drill down 50 meters um, by hand. And so it's all about self-sufficiency and, and um, self-sustainability. And so they like to use local people, um, raise money locally in order to, to create a situation where they can have independence and they can uh, take care of themselves and, and take part in that, and not just receive aid, um, but have kind of a worldview change of how they, um, they make life there and yeah. community. Which is amazing. And mm-hmm. I mean, the Wells Project, obviously, is just one of a couple or actually, I suppose, many of the inspirational mm-hmm. documentaries that you've been a part of. Mm-hmm. Talk to me about Flashbulb Entertainment, sort of sure. turning on the lights, I guess. Sure. First off, I mean, it's your own production company. Mm-hmm. So how, how did you end up with that gig? How did wow. you create Flashbulb Entertainment? Well, Flashbulb Entertainment was formed uh, back in high school. Um, I formed the company back in 2009 in my senior year of high school. Sort of to to actualize a lot of the uh, the dreams that I had had uh, back then, and it was basically just me and a bunch of my friends um, who all kind of lived in the same neighborhood and had pretty much a collective dream um, to bring a certain kind of story into this industry and really tell a different story. And um, <laughs> you know, we were out of our depth from day one, um, <laughs> so we sought the advice of a lot of our our, our parents and a lot of their friends, and basically. We formed this production company, and it's a fully legitimized, fully trademarked production company called Flashbulb Entertainment LLC. And basically, it was myself and uh, the kids I used to ride bikes around with, you know. And uh, that's sort of the sensibility, the mentality we had going into is that we were going to keep that. We were going to retain that um, identity, even though it was going to become this corporate um, entity, finally. Um, and so we formed that company, and ever since then, you know, everything I've done is under that umbrella, under that insurance. And basically, it just provides an avenue for us to to be legitimately in this industry, uh, even though our stake is small. Um, it allows us, to, it gives us a lot of authority when it comes to casting and bringing people on board, because it's it's a company, you know, and it's fully functional. And um, I think people take us more seriously for that reason. And of course, we, we run up against being young all the time. You of know? course, well, yeah, uh, and just the natural <laughs> inexperience. Yeah, of course. And when you say us, I guess it's a collection of yeah, yeah, yeah. USC students mm-hmm. and kids from high school and yeah, yeah, yeah. And... It's sort of a it's sort of an eclectic group. I mean, there's some guys from high school who are brilliant. I mean, prodigious people from my high school that are three years younger than me, um, but have just a lot of skill in different areas, especially with camera. And then people I've met here at USC. It's been a good amalgamation of people I've met throughout my past uh, eight years or so. Um, and of course, nobody's older than 22. Right. Um, cool. So I, you're not, yeah, you're, you're probably 22. Yeah, no, just turned 22. When, when's your birthday? September, yeah. Yeah, mine's September, yeah. September 18. 
Ah, uh, so turn twenty seven. Ah, mm-hmm. very cool. Yeah, I just turned twenty one. <laughs> I'm not I'm gonna have I'm a drink there. for the first time in a while. <laughs> I've not taken advantage of that, believe it or not. Uh, but I guess it doesn't surprise you. It's been a crazy semester. Oh yeah, all the way yes. through with Beatles and all that tough stuff. <laughs> oh yeah, tough classes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. with the LSATs really threw me for a loop. Uh, sure. But uh, I guess it was as we go down the line here. I mean, of course, the Dropbox documentary. We've covered this extensively here mm-hmm. on Conrad's mm-hmm. Corner. You pioneered that project, mm-hmm. and just for the folks who don't know, the Dropbox Dropbox is, is basically, it's an orphanage in South Korea, mm-hmm. and it's called the Dropbox because parents of disabled kids will abandon them and put them in the Dropbox. Mm-hmm. And then Pastor Lee, who you work with extensively, rescues these kids and raises them as if they're his own kids. Yes, It's just a story that just, we cover it time and time again, but every time it just seems more and more unreal. So yeah. tell me about that. Like, how did you first hear about the Dropbox and uh, sure. where where the documentary go? Sure. Well, okay. So let's backtrack a little bit. So way back. Um, <laughs> it, it seems like it now. Gosh. Um, just recollecting, I I read an article in the on the front page of the Los Angeles Times in June of 2011. The title of that article was "South Korean Pastor Tends an Unwanted Flock," and the angle of the article was about how this man in Korea had built this this big mailbox for children. Um, but it was its focus was primarily on how a lot of the children had disabilities or deformities. And, of course, my interest, being from a very image-centric culture in Orange County, was trying to understand why these children specifically were rejected and what and how the, the cultural mores influence that, but also how we, in, in a universal sense, um, reject children or people and outcast people. Um, and so that was really what struck a chord with me in the beginning. Um, it's obviously become a lot more than that, but I read this article and I sent out an email to the LA Times thinking, okay, well, they're never going to respond to me, but this story needs to be told, you know, and that's all I knew at the time. And uh, they got back to me the same day with some information, and they sent me an email address at Hanmail. I thought, if I'm going to send Gmail to Hanmail, it's going to get kicked right back, <laughs> you know, and, and it did. It did get kicked right back to me, but about a month later, I got an email in really broken English saying, from Pastor Lee himself, you know, saying, um, we'd love for you to come out and film a documentary. We don't really know how that works, but we'd love to just have you in our home. Thank you. God bless you. And we'll hopefully see you soon. Wow. And so fall semester 2011, you can picture me just trying to talk to people saying, I think I'm going to Korea. And of course, me not being Korean um, and having no connection to this family or to documentaries, um, even as a filmmaker, is never something I considered. People were confused, but also really excited. And a lot of people came out of the woodwork to assist me that were Korean Americans, uh, especially here at USC. Uh, And so we collected a team. And uh, honestly, you know, God opened a lot of doors for us, just uh, providing us with incredible amounts of equipment um you know we had red cameras fall from the sky that sort of thing and uh, we put this team together and eventually we flew out a team of 11 in december of 2011 to stay with pastor lee and his family during christmas time so i basically uh, lived at the orphanage for two weeks um I left home, you know, the first Christmas that I wasn't at my house, you know, wow. in, in down south of San Clemente. And uh, I lived with this family, and I felt like that was the only way to effectively um, understand them and just to be in their world and be sick when they were sick. Um, and so, yeah, we live with them and with cameras, and um, we, j- we went back about nine months later uh, as well to get some pickups and reshoots, and we're in the final stages of finishing that movie. Um, and it's been super blessed, and God's been really faithful to that whole process and that whole uh, leap of faith that we took initially uh, a year ago. And when does it come out? Are you guys going to screen it here at SC? We, we hope to. You know, um, Obviously, the documentary process is it goes through a lot of mutations, and um, because it's actually changing in the real world, there's always adjustments that need to be made back. And um, so, for example, there's been some... Uh, proposed bans of drop boxes in different countries, and that's something that needs to be addressed in the movie. And so, there's, I'm constantly returning to the edit to underst- what, understanding what's going on in the world, which is just the nature of the beast, you know. Yeah. Um, so basically, we are hoping to show it on campus um, before the end of my last semester here as a senior. And, and uh, mine too. That would be nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, and so, and to be honest, you know, that's that's important to me. Obviously, USC has been a huge part of my development as a as a filmmaker. And uh, everybody involved in the project is, is, for the most part, is USC. And so, basically, um, the film won't be released publicly in the sense that it won't be distributed and probably until next uh, summer or fall, but we'll definitely be showing here on campus next semester. Awesome. Well, it's an amazing message. And uh, I know personally, you know, as a journalist, and I did a documentary over the fall, not necessarily on something as nearly as inspirational <laughs> as the Dropbox, but uh, it's always a constant process. Mm-hmm. It's always a battle, but uh, that's what we do here. We fight on, don't we? That's right. Fight on. Awesome, guys. We'll come back here. Actually, we're going to uh, DJ Alley, the musical manager. It's going to be a great show. I guess she has some holiday tunes picked out for you.